Vitalik Buterin has been called the world's youngest crypto billionaire. He's the founder of second largest cryptocurrency Ethereum, which has powered applications of decentralized finance, NFTs, decentralized organizations, prediction markets, games, and much more. In an industry filled with greed and hype, Vitalik demonstrates thoughtfulness, patience, and a humble spirit that has led to his rise as a different kind of leader, and a bit of a meme lord thrown in there too. He has remained faithful to his decentralization principles, and throughout the years has moved his attention to creating public goods and more equitable social systems. Additionally, he has been very critical of the excess and wealth inequalities dominating the cryptocurrency field. Vitalik thinks there will be both good crazy and bad crazy in a robust, decentralized ecosystem, and he is utilizing his soft power to promote the former as much as possible. This is the story of Vitalik Buterin and how the voice of reason in crypto came to be. On January 31st, 1994, in Kolomna, Moscow Oblast, Russia, Vitalik was born. He was raised in Russia until he was six years old, at which point his parents made the decision to move to Canada in an attempt to find better employment opportunities. He was enrolled in a gifted education program while he was in the third grade at a Canadian elementary school. Vitalik immediately understood that his unique abilities and skills made him somewhat of an outcast among his friends and even teachers while in the program. He had a natural aptitude for math and programming, showed an early and intense interest in economics, and could mentally add three-digit figures twice as quickly as the average child his age. Buterin avoided social events and extracurricular activities. He recalls that a lot of people treated him like he was some sort of math prodigy. After that, he attended the Abelard School, a private high school in Toronto, for four years. His attitude and academic performance significantly changed as a result of the school's shift in his concept of education. He adopted Abelard's characteristic thirst for information, effectively making knowledge his life's work. He happily played World of Warcraft, WoW, from 2007 to 2010 aside from his studies, but the night when Blizzard had decided to take away the damage component from his favorite Warlock Siphon life skill, he cried himself to sleep. After realizing how awful centralized services could be, Vitalik decided to stop playing World of Warcraft. In 2011, Vitalik discovered Bitcoin while looking for a new direction in life. At first, he was skeptical since he didn't understand how it could be valuable if it had no tangible support. However, he continued to learn more and developed a fascination. He wanted to buy some tokens to formally enter this new and experimental economy, but he lacked the resources to mine them or the funds to buy Bitcoin. Therefore, he searched for Bitcoin employment on numerous sites before starting to write articles for a blog, where he could make about 5 Bitcoin every piece. He investigated all the various political, technological, and economic facets of cryptocurrencies simultaneously. Mihai Alisi, a Bitcoin enthusiast with a base in Romania, was drawn to his essays, which led to the co-founding of Bitcoin Magazine in late 2011. He was spending more than 30 hours a day writing, traveling, and working on crypto. As a result, he made the decision to leave university. After studying numerous cryptocurrency initiatives while traveling the globe, he came to the conclusion that they were too narrowly focused on a few applications and not wide enough. After looking at the protocols those objects were utilizing, Vitalik came to the conclusion that all the functionality of the protocols could be replaced by a Turing complete programming language allowing for a tremendous generalization of what the protocols were accomplishing. Given the right algorithm and the required amount of time and memory, a computer can solve any specific problem using a Turing-complete programming language. Therefore, he chose to develop it himself after being rejected by the previous projects, which led to the creation of Ethereum. Late in 2013, Vitalik Buterin wrote on a sheet of paper outlining his concept and distributed it to a select group of his friends, who further spread it. About 30 people got in touch with Vitalik to talk about the idea as a result. The original concept for Ethereum was still largely focused on virtual money. The vision evolved over time, and by the end of January 2014, the team had come to the realization that decentralized file storage is comparatively simple to build, and that ideas like name registry can be accomplished with just a few lines of code. The project's core team, 
which included Vitalik Buterin, Mihai Elise, Anthony D. Iorio, Charles Hoskinson, Joe Lublin, and Gavin Wood, was publicly revealed in January 2014. During a Bitcoin conference in Miami, Buterin also gave a live presentation of Ethereum. So back, back when Bitcoin was uh, originally created in 2009, Satoshi was, was really testing two things at once. So the first part is there is this idea of Bitcoin, the decentralized currency. It's a form of money that exists purely online and you can transfer it from anyone to anyone in the, around the world instantly with pretty much no fees. You can transfer money from Kyrgyzstan to Guatemala just as easily, just as quickly and just as cheaply as you can to your own neighbor. A few months later, the group decided to launch an initial coin offering ICO, of Ether, the Ethereum network's native token, to raise money for the project. At about the same time, Vitalik himself was awarded a $100,000 Thiel Fellowship grant. Through the sale of ETH, the team generated more than 31,000 BTC, or over $18 million at the time. The Ethereum team founded the Ethereum Foundation, a non-profit body with headquarters in Switzerland, to manage the creation of Ethereum's open-source software. Despite significant difficulties, Ethereum's crowdsourcing effort was a success. Overall, simplicity, universality, modularity, agility, non-discrimination, and non-censorship are all intended to be adhered to in the architecture of Ethereum. Regular changes to the Ethereum network's fundamental architecture have been made, including the London, Berlin, and forthcoming Shanghai hard forks. To continue Ethereum's natural march towards Ethereum 2.0, ETH2, also known as Serenity, these improvements include a number of network changes. Ethereum 2.0 is anticipated to significantly improve the current ecosystem in a number of areas, including price, performance, functionality, and minor issues. The demand for Ethereum's current version has caused network fees to increase to record levels, making the majority of transactions too expensive for the average user, Vitalik recognized. Additionally, there are many other things that people are building in the Ethereum realm, making it more of a utility platform similar to the Apple app ecosystem. Even said, the blockchain's capacity to handle all of the transactions is struggling to keep up with demand, so the scalability and proof-of-stake work being done by the Ethereum team on the technical front is quite significant. Proof-of-stake enables quicker transactions and lower fees than the previous proof-of-work paradigm. Investors in Ethereum can stake their assets in stake pools under the proof-of-stake model to gain rewards and gradually increase their holdings. At the Start Me Up HK Festival 2021's virtual fintech forum in May, Bucharin said that building Ethereum was taking longer than he had anticipated. As far as uh, technology goes, the uh, big story of last year and this year and probably next year as well is this uh, set of upgrades that we, you, we used to call Ethereum 2.0, but now we actually call it Ethereum 2.0 a bit less because we want to emphasize that, you know, this isn't throwing out the uh, existing Ethereum platform and making it a totally new one. It's a much more uh, kind of incremental set of changes. He said that the proof of stake implementation took six years longer than the Ethereum team had predicted. But it, this uh, kind of bundle of uh, upgrades has two big parts. One is called a proof of stake. Uh, so this is a consensus algorithm. So it's uh, the way that the blockchain agrees on what new transactions uh, people send in what order and protects the blockchain against the tax. So right now Ethereum uses proof of work. Because of the potential hazards, Boudrelin underlined the significance of having Ethereum's most promising option as a unique upgrade from the rest for long-term scalability. Sharding is the name of this eagerly anticipated feature. Sharding is the technique of horizontally splitting a database in order to spread out the workload lessen the network congestion, and increase transactions per second. The capacity of Ethereum's data storage and access will likely expand as a result of the shard chains. On the other hand, the substantial change to the new network suggests a unilateral shift from decentralized planning by developers and miners to Vitalik Buterin and his associates. Additionally, it modifies buyers' expectations of getting dividends in line with their level of network ownership. 
Ether will consequently resemble an investment security far more than decentralized network money. In 10 years, Bucharin envisions Ethereum running the metaverse. The concept of the metaverse is a huge virtual environment where users can communicate with one another and avatars of digital objects. He asserts that Ethereum is remarkably positioned to play a key role in the metaverse since items can move between platforms thanks to the internet and shared state. In general, he thinks that the Ethereum name service, ENS ecosystem, offers these solutions and provides a Web 3.0 username for all of your Bitcoin addresses and decentralized websites. He also believes that the idea of users and items having cross-platform identities is an obvious application that people don't understand. Bucharin is primarily interested in the cryptographic proof known as ZK Snarks which enables one side to prove that it is in possession of specified information without disclosing it. The contact between the approver and the verifier is essentially eliminated. In his opinion, ZK Snarks will be the privacy-preserving technology that is most widely used in the upcoming 30 years. Bucharin believes that once it expands into the public over the next 10 to 20 years, it will be a major revolution. Decentralized finance, or DeFi, will prosper in the future thanks to Ethereum, a long-term, function-oriented cryptocurrency. However, a lot of people hold off on taking any action until official legislation are passed. Big investors and corporations view the future introduction of such restrictions as a source of stability that might lead to wider adoption. In contrast to long-term cryptocurrency investors who worry that regulation will limit the market's current flexibility. Markets become safer for average people when they are regulated, and Ethereum, with its abundance of decentralized apps and services, can then become mainstream.